Now, verse 5. In that verse we read, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now here is what the harlot that we now know historically and doctrinally as Romanism. That she is crowned with all the flashing terms of what she is. All laid out in capitals so that all may read and see what she is. That she stands for blasphemy. Total blasphemy. Now verse 6. And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Yes, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. This woman, this whore, this harlot. Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So the woman is said to be drunken with the blood of the saints. This woman. Do you know that Romanism makes saints its own saints? Paints them as Christian. Declares herself to be Christian. What an absolute mockery. Because you see, she believes that she is God. So she can make saints. Only God makes saints. And while, of course, she makes saints, what does she do here? But she kills the saints of God because they are the saints of God. And seeking to do away with the saints of God, she can put her own filthy, dirty, beggarly saints in their place. Now, if this is not anti-Christianity, a system that sits as God showing itself to be God... In creating all that represents God, I don't know what is. Now John sees this woman, <clears throat> this wonder, this setup, and is given to marvel. Because it is far, far greater than the setup that he is used to. Because he was a Jew who saw the rituals and ceremonies and all the gaiety and the clothing of Judaism. Here he is now faced with a different picture. A greater picture than that. And of course all the world is taken in by this. <clears throat> and whilst he expresses his admiration he is simply reflecting what the world does. It has admiration for this beast. Now we run on verse 7, because we have a lot to cover. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? See, this is what the world does. It marvels at this huge, glorious pageantry of the setup of Romanism. As it did with the Romanism of old, Imperial Rome. Where, why, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So it is that the angel of the Lord here pulls John up. To show him more of this fiendish woman and the system. The beast that carrieth her. This beastly system. And is reminded of the beast that is Rome. Seven heads and ten horns. Of which John would have understood to be pointing to Imperial Rome and how it is that this whore is one with Imperial Rome. 
Now verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. You see this beast was present in John's day. But we're going to and forth here. The angel is going to and forth to show where the beast rose from, that it shall be, because this is a vision of all things that are going to be coming upon the world, upon the earth, as John stands here at the foundation of the world, seen across the world. So at one stage, he can see that Romanism, rather Imperial Rome, is there in front of him. But of course it goes back that it should be as he saw it to be. Because it was all predestined by God. Do you know, when Rome started out, Imperial Rome, before it became imperial. It was simply a village of people. Just a village amongst one of many villages. And then one day it rose up and it decided that it had got enough teaching from the Etruscan neighbours and it went to war with the Etruscans and to slaughter them. They kept a few back as being positioned as kings, because some of the kings, of course, the original kings of Imperial Rome, were Etruscans. But of course they were eventually done away with for senators and senators to em emperors. And so it was that Imperial Rome went into perdition. Began not as a war warring people, but it eventually ended up fully as a warring people to conquer the world. And so it is that it went into perdition and once into perdition there was no coming back. It had crossed the line in the sand as Augustus crossed the Rubicon when he sought to take Rome and to be the head of Rome in that great battle. Now, there is also wonder here, is there not? The beast that thou was, sawest, was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottom of this pit and go into perdition, which we dealt with, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of life on the foundation of the world. They wonder, marvel. You know, in the times of Imperial Rome, people actually wondered and marveled at Rome. Who can make war with this beast? When they saw all the monuments and all the ways of Rome, they were overpowered, awestruck at the might of this people. And of course we know that the monuments were erected not only to show the might of what Imperial Rome was but in order to keep people in awe of Rome because Rome hadn't got sufficient armies to keep a garrison in every part of the world. So these also, these, these structures basically subdued the people, had them in awe, saying if we can go against this people, these peoples that have built these things, then we're in trouble. You see, it was an influence upon them not to make war with Imperial Rome, except of course for the Mongols, etc. And the beast, it says, <clears throat> that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, 
As we say, John had already seen the beast because it was that beast that had put him on the isle called Patmos. But of course, at the end of this verse, we're going over it again so as not to be able to forget where this beast comes from. Now it's also said that the only ones that were saved from worshipping this beast and following this beast are those written up in the book of life. In Revelation 13, 8 we read of the Lamb's book of life, one and the same. So that they are the only ones that are preserved from following this beastly setup that should eventually come to rule upon the ruins of all that it went forth conquering and to conquer in its own satanic might. And also when Romanism, popery, should come along, they are the only ones that should not worship this second beast. Because they are the elect, precious children of God. Preserved of God. God who has written them up in a special book that are contained within his thoughts because these are not literal books the thoughts of God are many books but they contain many many books and within the mind of God there is written up the saints of God they're saints because God has made them so and they cannot be anything but saints, just as the whore, as we said, cannot be anything but a whore. Now verse 9, we read, And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now here we come again to the whore, specifically to the whore, from where the woman sitteth. And to the seven hills that the woman sitteth upon. The seven heads now become seven hills upon which the woman sitteth, which we know to be reflected in the seven hills of Palat Palatine, the Palatine Hills of Rome in Italy. And so it is. We go on to verse 10. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen and one is. And the other is not yet come. He's, he's not yet come rather. And when he cometh he must continue a short space. Seven kings we come back to what? The kings of Rome. Imperial Rome. So we're going backwards and forwards <clears throat> in this chapter because we are sh being shown exactly where the whore comes from. How the, both Imperial Rome and Romanism are one in spirit and in practice, may we add, in every aspect. So that when we see Romanism, we are seeing Imperial Rome, but in a different setup. Now the last king of Rome did indeed continue for a short space as it is spoken of here. That he must continue a short space and he did, his space was actually short. They got rid of him and replaced him with senators. Now verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now we know Romanism 
went into perdition. It started out as a bunch of nominal Christians. It didn't start out as Christian. Those who say it started out as Christian are wrong. It started out as nominal Christianity. And nominal Christianity taught, as it does today, within that system, not only millennialism, but baptismal regeneration. This is what Tutulin taught. This is what Augustine taught. And others taught. The so-called early Thalovers, whom we should apparently bow down and worship because they were closer to the apostolic times. So you're saying that we should bow down to a bunch of hypocrites and a bunch of heretics who actually taught baptismal regeneration? No, thank you. Now in verse 11, as we've read, the beast is here reflective of the first seven kings. Rulers of imperial rule. That one aspect of the fall is seen, and then the other aspect of the fall, and then another aspect of the fall, and this is why we have them separated in the book of the Revelation. Now, we come to chapter 19, which the end time prophets don't understand, as they do not understand any of the other scriptures that they are supposed to understand according to themselves. And simply they don't understand because the vast majority, if not all, are dead in trespasses and in sins, and the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God. Now we read in chapter 19, verse 1, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. You see, after the removal of Jewry, that Antichrist amongst many Antichrists that was removed in AD 70, there was a great shout in heaven as there was at the cross. And of course, this here that we are going to read is the cross of Christ that should bring the death knell, sound the death knell to Jewry. That in time, as we say, AD 70, Titus and all the Roman armies came against Jerusalem and destroyed it. Now, and after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honour and power unto the Lord our God. What is the first thing we notice here? that all praise is towards God, not towards Jesus. How much we hear that these days, there's no God in our day. Go along the street, listen to the street preacher. Is God with him? No. There is this Jesus. Jesus here, Jesus there. Jesus everywhere, God nowhere. And speak to the man who doesn't want to know God. It's all Jesus, 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 Jesus on his knees. Their Jesus, the Jesus of Baal worship. Hear all. Praise goes unto God. As we see also throughout the Revelation. Because this is the first table of God. And this is where regenerate hearts point to God. The first table of God, of course, is to reverence God. Which we call filial fear. Not fear that we will be struck down. 
but that we have respect to God. We have God central, and we do, if we are regenerate. All praise and all glory, honour and power unto the Lord our God. And to notice something here. Not only is the first table of the law honoured, that all praise goes to God our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the first table beginning. The second table, of course, is to love thy neighbour as thyself. But here we see also men in heaven. After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Not angels. Of course angels join with the people. But people specified here. Elsewhere it's angels. We know angels do. Praise God every day, every night. Eternally, without ceasing. But here there are men. Men in heaven. Oh, no, 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 says Jewry and Judaizers. There's no men in heaven. They're all asleep. Soul sleep. Limbus patrum. Hmm? No, they're in heaven. Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God is the God of the living, not of the dead. You Judaizers that come to us posing as Christians, wolves in sheep's clothing, you know nothing. You are opponents to God. You fight God. There are men here in heaven. Freely justified because they're in heaven by faith. God-given faith. Not, not human-given faith, but God-given faith. So we have the saints of God, as we shall see, of the Old Testament here spoken of. Reflected in the work of Christ culminating at Calvary. The set piece, of course, being Calvary. Ordained of God for the sealing up and redemption of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Bride. And as we shall see, she is publicly at Calvary seen to be wedded to Christ from eternity to eternity. There at Calvary she is seen as being betrothed joined with Christ. That we shall come to. Now all the voices that were heard here again and again were the heavenly redeemed the people of God being in heaven. Justified by God. Just men made Perfect. Perfect in every aspect. Their souls and their bodies in heaven. Just men made perfect. And so it is we come to verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments. This is what they're singing. True and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the Great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Not today. Nominal Christianity continues to cry, God is love, we should not hate our enemies. We should love everybody, we should walk hand in hand with the Myra Hindleys and the Adolf Hitlers. We should not stand in judgment against them, but all the voices here of just men made perfect are in fact decrying the wicked, because God decries the wicked. We have mercy and compassion and understanding upon our fellow man, 
But when it comes to the wicked amongst us, we have no time. We stand by God. We judge them as being evil. We say to everybody, stand clear of them. The judgment of God is upon them. And hallelujah that God has judged thus. Go into a Pentecostal church, a charismatic church, any church in this world today and it's hallelujah god is praise this god is but there's no pra there's no praise of the judgment of god upon the heads of the wicked no because they are without god in this world they are worse than the common man at least the common man has the decent decency to say that he is opposed to god not pretending to be one with god deceivers are the worst Kind. Judgment here is praised by the children of God. This follows on from the salvation that each and every child of God receives. And that God is true and righteous in his judgments that he hath judged the great hall. And we know the great hall to be Romanism. We're back to Romanism. That filthy, dirty, disgusting whore. That is Romanism. Imperial Roman religion. That she hath corrupted the earth, the world, with her fornications. That is, that every aspect of the governments of this world are influenced by her wickedness and that all roads lead to Rome. Even secular governments are whores, they get into bed with anyone. One moment they're in bed with this one, this enemy of their own nation, next moment they're out of bed and in the bed with another nation. Are being opposed then to the first nation and leaders, never for the people, opposed to those that they have climbed in bed with. So it is, that's the world for you, the fallen world of wicked men in high places. Here, the blood of the saints of God are said to be avenged at her hand by the Christian God, not the neo-evangelical God. The servants of God here sing of the praise of God for judging the whole just. And verse 3, and again they said Alleluia, and her smoke rose up ever and ever. Again, fancy going into a Pentecostalist church and looking at the smiling piece of vermin behind the pulpit who's raising his hand and saying, Hallelujah, God, this, God, that, have. hang on a moment, but Hallelujah, God has judged us. Hmm? No. The servants of God are one with God in the judgment of his enemies and their enemies. Hmm? 